Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the third MAP Masterclass. Today's one is about business plans and their uses and misuses and why they are very important, especially <laughs> if you want to obtain government grant funding. Today, we're absolutely stoked to have Professor Dan Galai on loan from the Hebrew University. He's been out of here for a few months. Dan has taught at UCLA, UC Berkeley, INSEAD. He has taught at NYU at Stern. He's an entrepreneur as well as being an academic, and he started a number of businesses and had a number of exits. And he recently invested in a business that I think was sold to Apple a few weeks ago. And so uh, please make Dan feel welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Pleasure being here so far away from home. Um, <clears throat> and again, I don't know what is your experience in using, misusing business plans. Uh, I'm dealing with a high tech financial innovations for many, many years, over 30 years, reading business plan, writing business plan, mentoring. Uh, <clears throat> let me briefly take you about my uh, CV, sort of, uh, to highlight the issue of the, what I'm engaged in, so, because I'll give many examples from businesses I took part in, uh, I helped writing a business plan, seeing what's going, what's right, what's wrong. Uh, <clears throat> I define myself as a person dealing with innovations, financial innovations and technological innovations. My, my PhD is from the University of Chicago on options. And my research is on options and risk management. That's my academic research. Uh, among other innovations, I invented the VIX, the volatility, the fear index, which is now very commonly traded all over the world. It's implied volatility taken, implied from option prices, but that's for a different lecture. A, I co-authored books on management, but also a book on business plan process, which is being, we are writing now the English version, which should be out by the beginning of 2014, I believe. It's almost done, it's almost finished. We had the Hebrew version, we had the French version, and it was a pretty successful book, especially for scientists that have no clue about business administration, providing them some of the foundations of finance, strategy, marketing. And I'll talk about some of those issues in two weeks in the second lecture. I'll highlight some of the issues today, but it will be mainly in, in the next uh, lecture. Um, <clears throat> okay. I. As I said, I participated in many new ventures. I also dealt with some policy issues from government side uh, with the Office of the Chief Scientist in Israel, which is very active in promoting new innovations. And also with the, minister, the Prime Minister Office, they had a special office for R&D. So for many years I worked with them on trying to initiate some industries in Israel and to push innovations. I know that it's a major concern here in Australia today, and I'm trying to help from my experience. Uh, I co-founded more than 10 years ago a company by the name of Mutual Art. Um, it's really a very interesting startup bordering its art and finance. It's providing pension-like benefits to artists all over the world, emerging artists, um, those that are going to be superstars, we hope. And it's based on barter, they provide artwork, we pull it, we share it. It's a lot of risk management elements and venture capital elements in this business. So some examples I'll take from Mutual Art, it's now on a global basis. We have more than 2,000 artists and more than 10,000 art pieces in our collection. Um, <clears throat> Companies that I was also engaged in, and I'll give some example, Oridian. Oridian is started in, basically in 1985. It was a, an idea that came from the Hebrew University, from the physics lab, laboratory. 
it was identifying CO2 by infrared technology, but the wavelength, I, the light source is on the right wavelength of like CO2. So you can identify when you have small quantities in the air, in breathing, for example, and you don't need shoppers and filters to identify that you have the CO2. So it can be used for mobile units, etc. And some examples I'll give from this one. Uh, I can tell you where it stands today. It started, as I said, in 85, two people that came from the physics lab. They took the ID, paid royalties to the university with the researchers that was in charge initially. Last, they are traded in Switzerland and they were just purchased by Covidian in the United States for $350 million. Uh, but it was really a tough road, not a simple road from 85 to 2012 when they were purchased. Uh, but it's a very interesting case study, and I'll highlight some of the issues along the way. Uh, Quigo is another company that I was involved from the beginning. It was a search engine, similar to Google, but it was actually the invention or the innovation they came up with initially was not only searching the HTMLs pages like Google did initially, but also go after the dynamic pages. Of course, later on, Google did the same. So they had to change the strategy, and it was really more the clients they focused on than the technology. Uh, this company was sold in 2007 to AOL for $360 million. Uh, Nitron is a company in a completely different field. As you see, it's very sort of uh, crossing different fields. Nitron is a pu water purification company using reverse osmosis, but it's electrodialysis, actually taking Japanese invention. They want to produce salt from seawater. So they put this equipment, took seawater, poured the water back and took the salt. We use it exactly in the opposite way. To take waters that were saline, especially well waters that were contaminated by nitrates and chlorides, and we took the salt out and the pure water we put back into the system, in the drinking, actually, and you get fantastic high quality uh, water. By doing it, it was improved and the efficiency was brought up to something like 98%, meaning that you take contaminated water, 98 of it you can recycle, and, on, and you have to get rid of the 2%. And that's a major concern, especially when it, you are talking about inland water, and the question is what to do with all the waste. So you want to minimize the waste, the transportation, and treating the waste. Uh, this company was also sold to a much major company dealing with environmental projects. Um, <clears throat> it was also a very interesting case study. Adbrain is still a it's startup from 2007. Actually, for the um, information sake, uh, my son is the founder of the company. Uh, he was also in Quigo. And Outbrain is in the blog space. It's really referring people to blogs based on their preferences. From going from blog to blog, the system can identify what they're looking for, what kind of information, what is a peer group that is relevant for them, and sort of giving them references to blogs that may be of interest to them. And the hit ratio is pretty high. <clears throat> Today, the company is 250 people, including four in Sydney, serving the Australian market. A Picama, I'm the chairman now, it's a company in the social games. Actually, they got the rights on a game, social game, that is called the Remicube. I don't know how many of you know Remicube. It's the third most popular board game after Scrabble in Monopoly. The third one is 
Vemicube already for 40 years, selling something like two and a half million boxes a year, especially in Europe, Asia, less so in the United States, I'm not sure how much in Australia. But they got the rights to do it on the internet, on, the, on computers, trying now to get it for cell phones. <clears throat> but it's, the idea is to develop more and more games that are social games, not gambling, but social games. Atari again is something different. It's really tools for IT managers of small, medium-sized companies. Many small size, medium size, they don't have the IT person, but they have, they outsource it. So you have now companies that deal with many small companies and manage their ITs, and usually it's done by distant type, type of management. So they supply them with the tools, mailboxes, firewalls, etc., and the system where they can, can control their clients. So it's a complete system, consistent system, and again, a very nice marketing idea. ArtSignet is a relatively very new company, one year old. It's about protection of artwork. Combining all kinds of technology like RFID, special glues, and also photography in order to identify paintings, artwork, and to f track them. And again, when we'll talk about what is the role and the objective of the business, we'll come to some of those issues. Gut energy is also a completely different one. It's uh, producing electricity, small scale, two stations. Each one is power plants, actually. Each one is uh, 70 megawatts, um, fueled by gas, very efficient. OK. And then I have my investment company, but that's not the topic for today. OK. Now, I'll uh, bring some additional examples from my experience. But when I look at, again, many, many years of experience looking at some, some that were successful, some that failed, many start from technology. And especially if you come from a university, if you come from sophisticated industry, you are sort of looking at technology. And to have the best technology is not necessarily a recipe for success. By the way, who was the first company that came with the calculators? Texas. We are talking about the 70s. Wrong. Texas Instruments. No, it's wrong. Okay. <laughs> so who was it before? Texas Instrument? They were the second. But who was first? We don't even know. Nobody here knows, I can bet you. It's a company by the name of Belmer. The company had the best technology, I mean the best idea. They came in the early 70s with the idea. They gave Texas Instruments to produce the components because they were the leaders in producing the components. Once Texas, re Texas Instruments realized that it may be fantastic excellent idea, and the protection, IP protection, is not fantastic, they really started to not only to produce the components, but also the final product, reducing prices. By the way, you know what was the price for the initial ones that were four sort of a, a manipulate, I mean, plus minus, divide and multiply, the four basic, operations, it was about $500 a piece. What you d today you buy for $2, $3, then it was $500. So Texas Instruments got in <clears throat> full force, reduced the prices to 200 It was a great bargain. <clears throat> Everybody was buying it, and they disappeared. So having the best, to be the best, the first in the market, to be the best in the market as far as technology does not necessarily guarantees that you'll be successful. And I have a long list of products where people came from, for example, military industries, <coughs> knowing to produce the best equipment that is what we call mil-spec. 
military specification, meaning that it can stand freezing conditions of minus 30 degrees or heat of 110 degrees and to fall from the roof and not break, etc. And they try to take the technology into the civilian market. And they really had the best technology, the most reliable and powerful technology. When they came to the civilian market, they were killed. It was dead. They couldn't sell it. It was much more sophisticated and too expensive for the civilian market, which is very much price sensitive. So again, you have to match and to think about how you match technology, needs, market conditions, etc. By the way, I forgot to tell you about uh, in my CV that I also, for many, many years at the university, I ran a seminar, Initiating New Enterprise. So we had teams of students, four or five students in a team. Each year we had about five teams on average. And they were looking for completely new idea, not necessarily high tech. It could have been services, it could be low tech, it could be high tech, everything. But they have to come with an idea, look for information, form a business plan, and out of more than 200 that I mentored over the years, I would say that more than 10% actually found their way directly or indirectly into the real world. I don't know, I didn't look at the statistics, how many are still ex in existence and successful, but some are, are actually. And also another point that I forgot to mention that last year we started as a pilot, a very interesting joint project between business school, medical school, engineer, school of engineering at the university. And again, some of the examples I'll borrow from this uh, pilot. Initially, it was a seven months course, one year actually. Very heavy, they had 70 hours classroom lectures provided by physicians, by people from the engineering school and from business school. And I'll mention it soon. They were looking, the first two months, they were looking for needs at the hospital. What are the needs in instrumentation, medical instrumentation? Then they focused, each team focused, we had four teams, combined students from the three schools. Once they focused on a need, they had to justify it. Looking more or less at the market scale, at the IP issues, intellectual property and patents. And the engineers soon had to think about feasible solutions to the need. The next two months, especially the engineering students, were working on a prototype, trying to come with a device. The last part, everybody was working on the prototype to see that it can, it's operational, working on a business plan, and the last session was a presentation to venture capitalists, to experts in different fields of the four products they came up with. It was great success. I think that out of the four products proposed, I'll mention some of them, two probably will be commercialized within a year or so. Very good chances. Uh, I'll show you one of the brochures here. <coughs> okay. so. Yes, many of the technology-driven products do fail. That's really the conclusion. So you have to be aware not to look necessarily for the best technology, but for a need where the technology is needed. <coughs> a <coughs> Again, it's generalizing, and everything will be based today on generalization, but I'll give, as I said, some anecdotes and uh, stories about it. <clears throat> when I look at reasons for failing, many fail because they don't have strategic thinking about what they want to do. And I'll hi highlight it soon, I uh, will zoom in. You need, from the beginning, a good strategy and a good definition of strategy. Now, it doesn't mean that you, do, you don't change it. Yes, you change it, 
Because once you start to move, you find more information and you have to adjust. Okay? So it, <coughs> you must maintain flexibility and clear head about changes it, you know, when you face an intersection. And also some businesses had great ideas. They were maybe too early. Also they had difficulties communicating their innovation to the external world. Not only, not necessarily the government, but also to venture capitalists, to bankers, potential investors. And there are many, many innovations that really were too early. I can tell you from my experience with the VIX, with the volatility index, we proposed it to the exchanges in 1986. They didn't know what to do. We dealt with them for quite a while and said, who will buy, who will hedge, how all kinds of difficulties. It took 20 years, and it's product number one now on many of the exchanges. <coughs> we were too early because at that time we couldn't apply for a patent. Only about 10 years later, you could apply for patents in the United States for a way of doing business. So that's being too early. I engaged with a venture in the mid-80s that was an architect, very bright architect, that said, actually, our work as an architect is very boring. And it's very sort of going by very sort of organized and planned. We have so many elements, and what we do is combine the elements each time in a different way. You know, when you were kids, you had those uh, books where they are cut into three, piece, three parts, the head, body, and legs, and you can change the dresses and the heads, and you can do all kinds of combinations. And he said, that's exactly what we do as architects. We have different objects, and we only place them each time in a different way. So why don't we computerize it? And actually, he was the first to come with a computerized system for architects where they can sit with the client, and within two days, they can come with the whole concept, the whole planning, by, again, changing elements until people are satisfied. Based on some rules and restrictions and constraints and everything is f fed in, but then when you try to present it, it was too innovative at that time. Remember, in the early 80s, not everybody had a laptop. Computers were pretty expensive. Most people didn't know how to work. They preferred to have, like, here's the chalks. I didn't see chalks in five years in the business schools. It's amazing. It's only in statistics. They didn't change in 30, 40 years. But uh, that's really what I'm talking about. When you are used to work with Buller and the old equipment, it's very complicated to introduce something new. When you have to educate the market, believe me, it's a huge obstacle. So sometimes it's much better to be the second one, not the first one. The first one has to tackle the issue of educating the market. He's doing the preparation. The second one is coming already full speed. So sometimes being second is much, you have much greater advantage than being the first. <coughs> okay, now really I think this sentence is giving the essence, and I have this discussion all the time. People come to me and say, you know, business plan, the paper tolerates all the nonsense we put in, we can put whatever we want, window dressing, you know, and, and you can write fantastic profitability and show on paper everything. It's true, but it's missing the point. And I'll highlight some of these issues when we talk about business plan. And I'll show why we need the business plan, why it's so important. And I really believe that each business needs a business plan. And again, I'll zoom in and I'll explain why, not only is it saying, but really I believe in it. 
So first of all, the business plan is a managerial tool. It's a, an essential part in planning and evaluating new enterprises. But it's also useful as a planning tool for major strategic changes and when introducing new innovations in existing businesses. Actually, business plan is not only for startups. Business plan is also for established companies. And you know what? You'll be surprised. Business plan is also for social enterprises. Nonprofit organizations need a business plan. They need it even more than businesses, for profit businesses. So it's really across all type of organizations, a business plan can be useful. And again, not necessarily as something external, but first of all, internal. It is a management tool, an essential one. Now, in the process, and again, I'll highlight some of the issues in the, the second lecture, there are five stages. Therefore, I named the book The Business Plan Process, because it's not a one-shot operation. So first of all, the toughest part is to define the business. What is our business? The second part is collecting information. We have to engage in collecting information about our environments, competitors, potential competitors, technologies, potential technologies we can use, clients, the taste, sensitivity to prices, what we call price elasticity. We have to collect information, but we have to know that collecting information is costly and time consuming. So we have to decide how much information and how much time and budget are we allocating to collecting information. It's true, the more information we'll have, we'll have a more calculated, reasonable decision. But it may be too late if you miss the time. And I know guys, I had an acquaintance, he did, hard valves. He developed hard valves, the best in the world. But he was very much in love with the valves, and he was all the time improving them, all the time, afraid of appearing, coming out with something that is excellent, but he saw that it can be improved. So he continued engaging in research while the world was coming with different valves and each time sort of achieving what he achieved already a few years earlier, and they were commercializing them. He never commercialized his ideas because he was collecting information and try, trying to come with the best product. So not necessarily it's the right way of doing business. And you have to know when, when to cut and go ahead. And always you will have to make decisions with incomplete information. You'll always have uncertainty. Nothing you can do from eliminating uncertainty, including technological, not to speak about market uncertainty. Those are the effects of life. OK, stage number three is planning the business. Really having a plan, how we do the production, the marketing, auditing, manpower, organizational structure, that's part of the planning. We'll talk more about it. And then you can do, you can start preparing the business plan based on the information and clarifying the objectives. In the internal planning, we can write the document. And number five, st process step number five in the process is promoting the business plan, utilizing it internally and externally once we are done with writing it. <coughs> OK. So it's really the business plan is, as I said, based on a very thorough study of the business, including marketing elements, very important, technology, production, management, many elements that should be 
in from different disciplines, also in business and outside of business. And at the end, it should bring the financial results. Okay, usually it's, com it's coming at the end. And as I said before, it can be also for non-profit organizations. Any organization that is utilizing resources, that is using budgets, should be able to summarize what they expect in financially. Even if the last line is, no, we don't want to have profit. So it doesn't exclude it. And I want to really to highlight it. <clears throat> and it should highlight the targets, the objectives, what we want to achieve, milestones. The word milestones will appear again and again. In a business plan, yes, we want to put some milestones. Now the document should be something between 20 and 50 pages. Again, it's rough, not including appendices. And again, when we'll talk about how to prepare a business plan, I'll talk about using appendices because the reading should be very straightforward. Whatever interrupts with the reading should be put in an appendix. So you can provide much more information technological information, market service, etc., all in the appendix. Whoever wants to read it can read it to support what you want to say. But it shouldn't be part of the document. And as I say, also I'll highlight it, today it can be also in terms of PowerPoint slides. So, you know, you have two versions. One is you have the nice chapters written and the second version is more the, the PowerPoint slides, quick, fast, MTV type of uh, presentation. <coughs> okay, now when we talk about the business plan, and I said that the paper can bear whatever you write, yes, but a good business plan is one that is realistic. You want it to be believable. When people read it, they can be convinced that you can achieve it. Okay. And that it has value. It must highlight not only the strengths of what we are trying to do, but also our weaknesses. Especially if we are a startup, we are weak. We can fail. We, have, we face all kinds of risks. You should highlight also those issues, not hide them. People think that in a business plan you should hide all the problems. No, not at all. The more you shed light on and you deal with, people from the outside will realize that you really studied the business well and you understand it, that you are not too naive. When you hide it, they believe that you didn't deal with the tough issues. That you are trying to either to hide them or you are not aware to them. So smart people from the outside, and you should assume that people that read the business plan are smart enough. And they will ask you questions. So it's better to have the answers in advance and sometimes already in the business plan. You should demonstrate in the business plan that the business is viable. Again, it's risky, but viable. And why it's viable. And it should be well entrenched in its business environment. The different environments. Because the question will be, how are we going to succeed if we compete with Apple, Microsoft, Facebook, etc. Remember you are not alone. And remember that usually when you invent something, you re displace or replace something. Usually you're not going to avoid. 
Okay, so when you step on somebody's toes, you must take the reaction into account. Usually people are not going to sit idle when you try to destroy them, to replace them. They'll react, and if they have better resources, you have to be very careful about it. And look at how many efforts, you know, Microsoft never had the best product. They always had competitors with much better product. Always. But look what happened to the competitors, what happened to Microsoft. You know, when Microsoft came out, initially, there were maybe 10 companies doing the same. Lotus, one, two, three, all kinds of companies you forgot about. But they were as good as Microsoft, and even better, technology-wise. But they're not with us anymore. The same you can say about Apple. Apple was much better when they came with a laptop than IBM. But look what happened in the first phase to Apple. Everybody said you, they have the best technology, but still, nobody bought them. They were very limited in the market share. I'm talking about the late 70s, beginning 80s. <coughs> Okay, the business plan is not necessarily geared externally. It's a mistake looking at it only as an external document. First of all, it should be internal. I think it's much more powerful and much more useful as an internal document. Serving as a managerial tool internally to get, first of all, cohesiveness, understanding of the management, and people involved with the company. And again, I, I talk as if it's only startup, but as I said, it's true for established companies and for dealing with any strategic change. Once you are sure that it serves the purposes internally, it's being accepted. Everybody understands the objectives and understands the milestones. And we have sort of really deep understanding internally. We can try to sell it outside. But trying to sell outside something that is inconsistent with what is done internally is terrible. Again, smart people will find it very soon. They will talk to different people in the organization. They will understand that everybody is pulling in different direction. And the business plan is not describing what's going on. So first of all, it should be internal, and then it should be external. <clears throat> Managers usually being evaluated, especially in small, high-tech companies, say, against milestones. But it's also true for established companies. Now, when it's done internally, and again, I don't say that you'll see the word dynamic coming soon. The business plan is dynamic. You can change the stuff. But initially, those are the milestones we are establishing. And I think it's very important to understand when you have to postpone milestones, what is the reason, why? To understand whether we still have chances to succeed. Oridian that I told you before, the CO2 monitoring, we wrote the business plan in 1985. Two people were in the company at the time. And what it, initially, we identified two major uses for the CO2, CO2 mo monitoring. One was medical, biological field. The second one was in industrial uses. Industrial uses, you have pollution control, efficiency of engines, etc. You have sub, six subgroups in the, under industrial. For the medicine, medical and biological, you have warehouses where you monitor the CO2. I don't know how many of you saw greenhouses where they apply CO2, and it's 
everything is growing in such high speed, it's amazing. So in each, actually, greenhouse, they apply CO2 all the time to speed up the growth of plants. But they have to monitor it. OK, then you have an <coughs> emergency room, in a surgery rooms, in labs, etc. So again, you have about six, seven subgroups. And the question was, OK, what are we going to do? Are we going to produce the light emission, the component, and sell it to the different producers? Or are we going to focus on one particular group? Initially, it wasn't clear. So we, in the business plan, we sort of mentioned all the different subgroups and market sizes. Actually, they took the business plan. It was really amazing. They took the business plan to the United States. They, did, they need money. They need, were trying to raise about $2 million at that time. They set about 15 meetings in the United States from East Coast to West Coast. They came home with 10 proposals. 10 of the 15 meetings produced interest. Most of the interest was to buy them out. People were willing to pay $1 million or whatever and to buy the technology. They loved it. It was really well-established, patents, everything was sort of well-founded. Now, after negotiations, they succeed to get m money from MSI. Do you know the MSI company, Cleveland? You know it, but you don't know the name. Mining Safety. Uh, it's a company established by Mr. Edison in the late 19th century for the helmets with the light for the miners. It was a, an Edison invention, and he established the company. But this company evolved. They still produce the helmets and some equipment for mining, but they also went into medical devices. So they initially invested in the company to get uh, hold of the technology they had uh, an agreement. <clears throat> OK, so they had milestones, very well-defined milestones, to develop some of the, for the medical, for the emergency rooms and the surgery rooms. And actually, they thought that it will take them three years to get, to get a product into the market. Two years later, the milestones still remain the same. Three years to penetrate the market. So it took two years to adjust, but no, they weren't ready for the market after the initial three years. They had to postpone it by addition two years. And the projection stayed more or less the same about how much they can sell when, when they enter the market. And you know what happened later on? Yes, they penetrated the market, but it took about 10 years from 85. Only in 95, they started selling. So they had to adjust, and they had good explanation. What's delaying? And I'll tell you some of the issues, some of the sort of decision points that they had to change and adjust the business plan. So yes, you have to set milestones. Yes, you can change the milestones when you face reality. So the view in the business plan should be long term, unless it's really hula hoop, yo-yo, booby cube. You know, you have always a, what a friend of mine called junk tech, all kinds of innovations that are you know that they will exist for two years, you know, they're gimmicks. And that's fine. You can make a lot of money on gimmicks. But the gimmick is short term. You know, when you, you produce a hula hoop or the Rubik's Cube, you, you know that you don't have a horizon of 10 years. You sell it and go to the next one. OK. But usually, many projects are longer term. And the business plan should be dynamic can be changed, should be changed, every half a year, every year. The, it's not holy. It's not a holy book that we put in a special place and signed and in the rock, inscribed in the rock. So we wrote it. It's on a word processor. We can change it. Of course, not every day. <clears throat> Uh, 
Okay. The business plan can serve basically three major groups. New business entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs and managers innovating within an existing company or organization, the issue of entrepreneurship, and managers who are evaluating a major strategy changes within a company or organization. So again, it's not limited. It's much broader than people think. So yes, I guess that most of you want to be new entrepreneurs, but sometimes you'll start to work in a company, and you can come with an idea how to change, how to innovate. Yes, then you should be engaged in writing a business plan. And if you are successful in leading a company, and you want to take it, or your division, into strategic change also. It's worthwhile to do it. It's a good exercise. <clears throat> okay, at the end of the day, when we start a business, especially if it's for profit, and we are trying to raise funds, we have to show the economic justification. Now be very careful. Some people believe that they are going to conquer the world. I dealt with a team, very interesting team. I'll, it's a, will be one of the examples I'll tell you about. They produced, they invented, they came from Russia, engineers in the early 90s, and they invented a new type of windmill to produce electricity. You know, the windmills that we have today, you see it here in Australia, two, three rotors made of heavy material on huge towers, weighing quite a few tons, and they're under tremendous pressure from the wind. They can operate, you know, between certain range of wind speed. When the speed is too high, they have to close them. If not, they'll collapse. Those guys came with a completely different idea. They said, what is the best friendly material to the wind? and said it's really like sailboats. So why don't we take the material from sailboats and produce a rotor? So the rotor they produced was actually like a bagel, a tire, if you want, inflatable, and some small sails in the middle. So it looks like a big circle tire with some sails, <coughs> and it's connected here sort of to a pole and to the turbine to produce electricity. So it's turning with the wind, very friendly. When it's stormy, you can deflate, take out the air. When you have a good wind, you can inflate it. Water, I mean air pump. And it can be scalable. It can be small. It can be large. Fantastic. They got patents, worldwide patents on this innovation. And actually, they got a patent also on having such a tire taking up something like 100 meter diameter, 200 meter diameter, but to take it out into space about 10, 20 kilometers over the Earth. Because there the wind is pretty consistent, so it can operate all the time. The only issue is how to transfer electricity 10 kilometers from space into Earth. That was the only issue. But you can do it. You can produce electricity in space like that. You can have stations. OK? So it was really fantastic. The cost, production cost, is minimal. According to their estimation, to produce a kilowatt of electricity would be like something like two cents. Today, production cost is eight, nine, 10, 12, 15, depending on what technology you use. So two cents, including capital cost. So they said, OK, the next year, we'll start, we'll sell $200 million. By the third year, we'll sell $2 billion worth of equipment. And I 
try to convince them, guys, don't be so hungry. It's not realistic. You don't have, how many businesses do you recognize over history, over the last 50 years, they captured a billion dollar startup this, that captured billion dollar within two or three years. You don't have, you don't have many, very, very few. And to say, okay, the value added will be 50%, 60%, so it, you know, we'll make already half billion dollars after three years, it's not realistic. So again, you can have dreams, but you have to be realistic and you have to look at things that are similar to see what's going on, how the world reacts, how much money is reasonable to make before you'll get into some issues. Okay, I won't tell you what happened later on, but the economic justification must be really realistic and not based on dreams. <clears throat> and again, I, as I emphasized before, also social philanthropic enterprises should always, and even more importantly, engage in business plan. Because the idea is comparing alternatives. You see, whenever we make a decision, whenever we make a decision, is always A against B. Okay? Always. Think about it. So the idea is to bring, even for social cause, what is the best way of achieving it? One way, another way. And to justify the way we selected. And to show that it's efficient and efficiently run. So again, the issue is not to show always profit if you are not for profit organization. So if you run a hospital, public hospital, university hospital, yes, it should be run efficiently. And when you use resources, you should be careful to run them efficiently. And I got into discussions, I, you know, in Israel, the military establishment, they spend quite a lot of money and I try to introduce with the economic office, the issue of business plans. We had a meeting, some generals, they yelled at me, they shouted at me, and they said, you don't understand. We are not profit, we are military, you know, you can't, business, the word business killed them. I mean, they couldn't bear the word business. I said, you know what? Don't call it business plan, call it operation plan. A, <coughs> something, planning document. Take the word business if it sort of interrupts with your thinking, but at the end of the day, you have to run whatever you do efficiently. So really that's, I think, what is behind a good business plan to show that the, what you want to do, you do in an optimal or efficient way, if not optimal. <clears throat> okay, uh, <clears throat> what are the objectives? So, one objective is really, as I said, presentation tool. To attract outside investors, partners, or to develop marketing channels. But again, take into consideration that the other party is not stupid and they can identify what is not real, not or too superficial, or a business that, that is not a valid business. And as I highlighted, and again, we'll move forward, is the business planning process. Okay. How much time do you have? Okay. So let me highlight the next two, which are the internal goals and the external goals. Internal goals is, first of all, to establish order and structure. You see, especially when you have a startup, you start from zero, you have now to establish the different functions, the R&D, 
marketing, production, etc. You have to put to see that it's consistent. You have a consistent plan. And you have a plan for the evolution and how you grow the business. You know, I saw some ventures that had a great idea, and they immediately started to hire people. Why? Because they will need them, also marketing people. They'll need them. They want to train them. But they didn't have a product yet. And once it took the product more than a year to be developed, you had overhead. All the marketing people, are co they cost money. They do nothing in the meantime. How much does it take to train them? And if you have any delay, you created a monster next to you that costs you a lot of money. And many businesses lost huge amount of money by having an organization that was not built proportionally for the purposes and the stage where the company was. So you want really to plan the right structure and to put in order. Because usually it's pretty chaotic. When you start a business, it, it is really chaotic. It should be like that. So the business plan helps you to put some order in the chaos. Second is the objectivity, especially with scientists. Scientists that are in love with the innovations. They are not objective, like the guys with the windmill. They were not objective. They loved the idea, and they thought it will, be, it will save the world from all the energy problems. So you, tr you try to do it. While, when you write it, it forces you to be more objective, to tame some of the enthusiasm. Not that you don't want the entrepreneurs to be enthusiastic about what they do, but at least in the planning, it should be objective. Number three is a team in integration. You have people coming from different fields. You have a scientist, for example, in the biodesign. We had people from the medical school, from engineering school, from business administration school. They talk in different languages. It's like a Tower Babel. They don't speak the same. They mean sometimes the same, but they talk in different terms. They see the world differently. So it forces them to write a document that all three teams can agree on, can understand. You create a consensus. You create a language, common language, to describe what you want to achieve. Number four is identifying and bridging gaps. You see, when you start a company, very often you don't have a marketing person, or you don't have a financial officer or an auditor, you try to save money. So you have some gaps, and you may fill them by writing and describing and using some experts in the writing what you want to do in marketing or what you want to do in manufacturing one day when you start manufacturing. So you are bridging some of the gaps of not having the right people at this stage, but at least you know what you want to do in the fields. And number five is encouraging people within the organization to think about what is the best way, how to innovate, how to do it more efficiently. You see, sometimes you have the superstar, and everybody is obeying to the superstar. And nobody is opening their mouth to say, no, we think that is on the wrong track. And very often, they can be on the wrong track. When you encourage people, the whole team, to participate in preparing the business plan, People will, will, can, can come up with great ideas. I can tell you, when we wrote the business plan for Mutual Art, we spoke to many artists, to many curators, museum, heads of museums, head of galleries. We got so many ideas. We are not, my partner, he had finished high school. He's sort of a serial entrepreneur, great thinker. A, I love art, I enjoy art, but I'm not an art specialist. So we had to fill this gap when we wrote it and to think about some of the ideas by talking to the people to find out what they want already in the early stage before we start the operation. So many great ideas came from people, smart people from the field. 
So that's bridging the gap. And also encouraging changing the direction from the beginning. Okay, the last one, the external goals are raising money through capital investment or debt. It can be also for government offices, absolutely. Developing marketing channels and establishing joint ventures. Again, you want, let me take the last one. For example, when you want to establish a joint venture with a company, providing them with a business plan so they know what you are all about, what you want to achieve, it can guarantee much better joint venture. Joint, joint ventures are complicated, also joint efforts, marketing efforts or production efforts. So once you can combine business plans, you can get better harmonization of the efforts. Okay, because you know what, you, what each party is expecting. So it's very important to align expectations. And that's really one of the issues also with investors. You want investors to have correct expectations. Expectations which are consistent with the organization. Okay, I think that we'll stop here. We'll continue in two weeks, I guess. Thanks very much. Thanks for coming down, guys. Thanks very much, Dan Goliath, for a great lecture. And we'll continue this series in another two weeks. Dan will be back to follow on from when we finished off today. Thanks. Thank you very much.